Alright, hey everybody, welcome to episode 17 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast, 20 minutes with some of the world's top fitness professionals. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and you can check out the show notes at stop20podcast.com, that's stop20podcast.com. Before you do that, go to iTunes, subscribe to the show, leave us a rating and a review. Like I said before, we're getting a lot of great feedback on the show, but uh, it's the ratings and reviews on iTunes that really help us out. All right, for today's episode, I have on Jason C. Brown, and Jason is widely considered one of the world's leading authorities on kettlebell training for fitness and sport. He's been helping trainers, coaches, and athletes improve their kettlebell training skills since 2003. His online resources at Kettlebell Athletics have become the gold standard for all aspects of kettlebell conditioning and training. He's been featured in Men's Health, Men's Fitness, Experience Life Magazine, and CNN Fit Nation. I think I just said kettlebell five times in 30 seconds. Jason, thanks for coming on today. Anthony, thank you very much, my friend. All right. Let's uh, let's get into this. What's your story? What's that spark that uh, kind of got you into a fitness lifestyle? I am from the coal regions of northeastern Pennsylvania. Tiny little town that had a very strong wrestling and football culture. There was a weight room in my basement. My brother trained there. All the neighborhood kids trained there. And uh, I think I fell in love with that pretty early. I, re- I remember formally falling into, lo- uh, falling into training around the age of 13 and ever since then it's been a non-stop so so was that more um was it more aesthetic because we're getting a lot of it's funny a lot of guys we had nick winkleman on last episode and uh a lot of a lot of people do who are ended up being performance coaches or or um or athletes um still started out aesthetic was it aesthetic for you or was just like kind of the thing to do or was it for performance i think in high school it became aesthetic i don't think in in well, maybe in, in seventh and eighth grade, it was a little bit aesthetic, but I just didn't, I mean, it's just a goofy time of life, right? I think high school, when I realized, oh, you can really get a wider back from doing pull-ups and stuff, then it became a little bit more aesthetic. But I think in, in seventh and eighth grade, 13, 14, I was a, so I came from a town that had a strong football and wrestling culture, but I was not one of those kids. I was a BMX kid. I was a, like a, a freestyle Harrow type of kid. And we actually used the the working out to improve our bike skills, not necessarily to improve a sport. I mean, some now it's a sport, but back then it was a you know it was like skateboarding. There was no sport; it was just a, a culture. Yeah, hey, that's performance, right? So there you go. But I think in high school, sure, when the when 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 your arms start to get a little bit bigger and and you can you know you see the girls' eyes go down towards your arms, and you're like, all right, a couple more. <laughs> Cable push downs. There you go. There you go. Still doing them. Still doing them. <laughs> um, Jay, you know, a sidebar here. When did you get into jujitsu? Obviously, you started in wrestling, but when did the jujitsu thing come about? 1996. So I got out of the Marines. I was living in the Poconos and then uh, Poconos of Pennsylvania. And there's not much to do there, Anthony. It's like, like I got out of the Marines. Um, I think I worked at Walmart a little bit. But it's really hard to make a living unless you're a tradesman or a craftsman. So I moved to Philadelphia and uh, I started in 1996 at the first Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy on the East coast run by, uh, he's still a mentor and a coach of mine, Stephen Maxwell. So he, and he was also the gentleman that had the first kettlebells as well, homemade kettlebells from one of his students. And I can send you a picture of those, Anthony, if you'd like, because I am now the custodian of those. There you go. That's awesome. I just saw recently, and maybe we'll get to this in a little while, a picture of you and Steve Maxwell at an event you guys just did. So very cool. Um, Jay, sounds like we got a lot of people coming up here in this uh, in this whole little story here that I, I I might know the answer to this question, but uh, who was your superhero growing up? Who influenced you the most? Growing up, Anthony, you knew this one was going to stump me. Can I talk about my current superhero? Uh sure, absolutely. Right. <laughs> who is so my current because I I. I was thinking about this because you really got me good with this one. My current superhero, and I'm not trying to get on her good side or win her favor or anything. My my current superhero is actually my wife. I'm not sure if you ever met her, Anthony, but she is uh, – she's – her name is Jennifer. 
She's from the slums of Rio de Janeiro. I'm not sure if you've ever been to Rio de Janeiro, but it can be, there's beautiful areas, but there's also very rough areas. And my wife is from one of those rough areas. The first time she took me, her sister said, you're going to hear gunshots out the window every night. And I did hear gunshots out the window every night. She moved here in the late 90s, the same time that I moved to Philadelphia. We didn't know one another yet. Didn't speak English, taught herself English. She came here knowing uh, Portuguese and Spanish. She is now a chemical engineer that works for General Electric, GE, speaks English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese fluently. Um, a master's degree in chemical educa- uh, chemical engineering from Drexel University. She is like that, you know, that the the American dream, you know, or whatever that is. And she did it, man. She came from the slums of Rio de Janeiro. And I just get down on people. I hear so many Americans complaining about how rough sh- shit is and, and how they can't get ahead. Man, you can get ahead. My wife came here with no money. She was a babysitter. Now she's a chemical engineer. She has three beautiful boys with me. We have a beautiful house. We have a beautiful life. And she did it because she had a hustle. And she's my superhero. Oh, and she she also makes this. I thought about this too, Anthony. She also makes milk. (laughs) That's a pretty potent uh, superpower, my friend. That's pretty awesome. That is, uh, I could see why she's your superhero. You're not just kissing up. Because I think she just became mine. So. Jay, I, I know you obviously you have three kids, and I always I always preface this question with with that. I mean, we understand everybody you know is going to say their kids, but you still you know with the with the kettlebell, you're you're a teacher. You have kettlebell athletics. You've been teaching at Equinox since really since I I started working there. That's that's my connection to you. Twelve years ago, th- eleven years ago, um, you've been teaching the classes for ke- kettlebell athletics among others. Um, you have the jujitsu practice. You have the strength garden, which is your your. Uh, your own practice. Who are you trying to reach? You have your websites. Who are you trying to reach? Who are you trying to be a superhero to? Anthony, currently, I, and I, I gave this a lot of thought as well. I would really love to reach more coaches and more professionals because I think uh, if if I reach one client, I reach one client, and I maybe I can reach their daughter, their son, maybe their husband or wife. But if I can affect and change the outlook or maybe the mindset of one coach or trainer, that trainer can effectively reach hundreds of thousands of people. I think I could reach more people if I did it indirectly through other coaches and other professionals, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I think I'm in a similar situation. I mean, it's why I sold my gym and it's why you know, trying to expand my internet business and trying to reach more trainers with more podcasting and more uh, educational opportunities for them. So I, I get it. Jay, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand um, and I wasn't sure I was going to ask this question to you, but um, I think it segues nice. It, we talked about kind of what's out there right now. We're kind of tired of talking about sets and reps all the time. Um, talk to me about what, where do you feel like the industry, the fitness industry is and where you'd like to kind of help influence it? Yes. So as, as we were talking before, Anthony, it's, uh, that's, that's one area that I actually want to help these coaches and the trainers in. We are in a relationship business. We are not – I mean people want to talk sets and reps. I, I'll, Anthony, so just during one workshop, seriously, I, this, I always have to bring this up. Somebody asked me, Jason – I think it was during kettlebell swings. I was coaching the kettlebell swings. What is your fifth metatarsal doing? And I just thought wow. there's a huge disconnect. Like your clients will never say, you know, Anthony, what is my fifth metatarsal doing? They don't care. You have to establish relationships with people. We are in a relationship business. I've had one client since 1999. She has basically paid for my house if I add up all of the sessions. I've tried to fire her numerous times, but she keeps buying herself Christmas presents and their sessions, right? I think we, ha- I think we need uh, more work on communication and how we speak and the words that we use and the coaching that we use, but also on relationship building. No lie, I was probably like this as well. A lot of trainers are very self-centered. You're on Instagram. I'm on Instagram Nobody cares about your abs except you or maybe a few other trainers, but that does not that does not entice clients. That does not entice 
the general population. You're doing that shit to impress other professionals. And I think there's also a, a huge uh, one-upmanship now online as well. Like, oh, you you have whatever, 90 degrees of flexion. I'm going to do 93 degrees of flexion and battle <laughs> on Instagram. Dude, That's it's just like one big incest thing. You know, it's like, yeah. Anthony, I'm, you post something and I'm going to post something that's cooler. And then you post something and then the clients are like, what the – who – what? What? You know, I can barely squat without assistance. I have to hold on to a door frame to squat and you guys are posting like, me too. <laughs> well, you know, I think what it, what it, you know, unfortunately the problem is it's like that, you know, it is the pendulum, right? The pendulum go- swings too far either way. And, and right now we are in an area where a lot of people don't really, you know, we're trying to, I think so many people are trying to use social media as a vehicle to get more clients, et cetera, et cetera. And they feel like they have to. Um, and I think, uh, you know, you look at who's doing certain things a certain way and how many followers they have. So yeah, I agree. You're right. And I think, I think a couple of years ago before really social media was this big, we used to talk about Mike, Mike Boyle and I used to talk a lot about like different trainers that would just be contrarian, right? For, or they would write yeah. blog posts, like the new way to do a push up. you know, really, is there a new way to do a push up? you know? And, and, and so I think like you're doing push ups all wrong. Okay. Nobody's really doing push ups that wrong. You know? So yeah. I, I just think, you know, it's, it's a similar situation. So I agree with you a hundred percent. Unfortunately, it, it's kind of a necessary evil, but, um, but um, you know, hopefully we'll uh, we'll straighten this out a little bit. I think the clients, like you said, the 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 the, the clients will figure out who's uh, who's doing the right thing and who's not eventually. Just like I think with a lot of blog posts, eventually. Yeah, who's who's in it for their own self and or who's in it to actually change the lives of their clients? I think that becomes pretty pretty clear pretty quickly. Yeah, I will say if I did have a six pack, I would be showing that every day though. But anyway, um, yeah. Jay, maybe, maybe never mind. <laughs> Jay, let's talk a little really quickly. I want to just we've been we talked to a couple of our trainers on here with uh, different gyms and different ideas. Uh, Kirsty Godso is working with Equinox on boot on like a developing different boutique gyms, and I have another. Uh, 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 trainer Nikki Metzger who you might have met at Nike um who also had said you know her gym was voted one of the best boutique gyms I kind of feel like you have a boutique gym if without being a boutique gym tell us a little bit about Shrank Garden because I, I think it's a unique uh concept uh that's uh the Strength Garden Anthony is my backyard it really is and uh it's where I I train daily well I don't know if I'll train today it's 14 degrees but I I I do sometimes go out and put the put the gloves on and, and still do stuff. So I have a big rogue rack out there. It's 15, 15 feet high. I have uh, ropes. And then I have my strength garden shed, which is a 200-square-foot Home Depot shed with 12-foot ceilings. That's what I can snatch in. I do, do all the lifting there. But I think it's – I think uh, the strength garden came about because I think a lot of people feel they need to to go someplace to exercise – when really all they need to do is step out their their back door or their front door and and explore explore you know their little bit of property that they have. I don't think you need a lot of material. I don't think you need a lot of equipment. Um, I mean, I use logs for boxes. You know, I use cut up trees for boxes and stuff like that. And uh, the the best thing, Anthony, the the highlight of my life with the strength garden is I think there's like twenty kids back here some nights. Twenty wow. kids crazy and it's boys girls uh we have two-year-olds up to 13 14 year olds i have two german shepherds they're running around uh, i have a nice john deere little mini and i don't have a backyard i i don't have any grass left because of it but um i just think uh you know i, I think people need to get r- rituals into their life and, and little rhythms and my rhythm is waking up and going out into the strength garden every morning and uh just moving and, and exploring and, and being alive. Mm. Love it. Love it. And we're going to do, uh, we got to do an episode of Strength Coach TV. I'm starting that up again very soon. So I want to come down there in the spring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. All right, Jay, now it's time for the stop and give me five segment, five rapid fire questions and answers. So, uh, 
Tell us something people wouldn't know about you or maybe not even suspect about you. Awesome. So in the 90s, when I moved to Philadelphia, I actually lived for about a year in a Hare Krishna ashram. I also toured the U.S. and Europe, the U.S. twice and Europe twice with a Hare Krishna hardcore band called 108. And that was a man. Wow. Yeah, those were awesome. Oh. I mean. This is before cell phones and social media, and I remember thinking, I didn't call my mom for like nine months. And then finally I got to Italy and I told some Italians that uh, I didn't call my mom, and they said, you have to call your mom. You call <laughs> nine months here, you called your mom. Nice. <laughs> and then you called my mom. But yeah, I, I, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very interesting point in my life, uh, living in that ashram and uh, touring with that band. Very so. cool, very cool. All right, biggest misconception about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Huh. Uh, that you have to be an exceptional athlete to do it. All right, I'll take it. Uh, you can have a kombucha with anyone in history, living or dead. Who would it be? Great question. Kombucha. I, I'm glad you chose kombucha, Anthony. That's awesome. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt. All right. Do you have just really quick? Do you have any history of like reading about him a lot, or do you? No, I. Just, I I stumble upon his stuff all the time, and I, I just find it very interesting. Seems like a, a pretty cool manly man, but also enlightened at the same time, not like a douchebag man. You know what I mean? All right, absolutely, I do. Uh, one thing you'd probably want all parents who are raising kids, from a sport and movement perspective, what would you, what would you want to tell them? Let your children play outside freely, unsupervised. Love. Not my, not micromanaged. Let them, you know, if if I'm 44, so if you're in my age group, let them have the same type of childhood you had. I came home from school. I opened the door myself. I let myself in. I did whatever little bit of homework I had, and then I was outside all day until the lights came on. And uh, you know, dangers aren't any greater now than they were. That's a misconception. That's a myth. There's stranger danger isn't higher anymore now than it was in the 70s. And uh, just give your children the same authentic lovely childhood that you had in the 70s and the early 80s love it that's ex that's we had the same childhood so uh awesome. desert island you got one book i know you're a voracious reader you're always posting different passages what book i'm gonna make you pick one what is it i would pick a collection of poetry from the uh poet rumi the sufi poet rumi from rumi okay great all right um, Jay, we're going to wrap this up. So what is a project you're working on right now that's kind of getting you excited? The Strength Garden Academy, the co-created coaching academy of Jason C. Brown. And to go back to one of your earlier questions, Anthony, this is a place where I'm going to, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and uh, I've made some great successes and I, I want to work with other professionals coming up in the field. They can leverage my success and they can also leverage my failures. And I just want to have a nice little, and I say co-create it because it's not going to be a membership site. It's going to be uh, more li like a very dynamic question and answer mentorship type of environment. No cookie cutter material. No, it's going to be you ask questions and you have, you can literally rent my brain five days out uh -huh. of the week. Very so. cool. Um Jay, what is that letter to your younger self? What what advice kind of would you like looking back that maybe things that maybe you did or that, that you might want to change? Give us uh, a little advice to yourself. All right. So and I hate you for this one, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have any regrets. I don't have anything that I would really change. I, I love the way I came up. I love my history, my past. But there's one thing that I think I, I did that was pretty much a – can I curse, Anthony? I think you already did, so it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. I, I think I was – I'll just use the word jerk. I think I was a big jerk. Um, my grandmother died, my father's mom, and I didn't have uh, – I didn't have a great relationship with her. Nobody – she did it. She wasn't a very warm grandmother. None of my cousins or brothers, none of us had a, a great relationship with her. But when she passed away, the day of her funeral, I moved to Philadelphia and I didn't go to her funeral. And I remember the look on my dad's face uh, when I got in the van to, to move. 
And, uh, you know, I, I spoke with a lot of people about what I did. And, you know, I, um, I regret that horribly. I, I have to write a letter to my father and apologize in person. But, uh, you know, yeah, I don't go to the you don't go to funerals for the uh, the person that passed away. You go to the funeral for their loved ones. And I think I was a, a huge jerk to my father then. So I would write a letter to myself saying, Jason, you're a dick. You should have stayed there and been there for your father. And uh, hopefully that would have uh, corrected that that mishap I had. <laughs> All right. Um... I'm, I'm, that wasn't too much, Anthony. No, no. It, you know, one thing is, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we have to forgive some of those things that we did in the past. We've all done some, maybe some horrible things. And uh, and I think, you know, listen, you've done some amazing things. And I think you're a leader in our field. Uh, that's why I wanted to get you on. And I think you're uh, you're going to be doing more great stuff. So, um, uh, you know, I appreciate you. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of us out there do. Uh, so, uh, Jay, just thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you for sharing many kombucha stories with me. All right. Well, that's going to do it for episode 17 of the Stop and Give Me 20 podcast. Thanks again to Jason C. Brown. Make sure to check out all the links to all his stuff at stop20podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Leave us a review and a rating. It'll really help us out. My name is Anthony Renna. Thanks so much for stopping by. <laughs>